Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the Three Minute Thesis uh, Preparation Seminar, I should call it. Uh, my name is Nick Matar. I'm with the Graduate School, and I am really excited to have um, our highly esteemed guest speaker here again. Uh, she is back for second, third. Uh, she's presented on this topic several years now, since before I was at the Graduate School. Um, and it is 1 a.m. in her, her time, so she's coming to you from across the world. And uh, we are really excited to, and, and always grateful to have, have Nisansala here with us to present. Um, she is a former 3MT champion, I should say. And uh, it's always a, always a delight to chat with her. Um, there will be time at the end for questions. But uh, without further ado, I am happy to introduce uh, Dr. Nisansala um, Muthanayaka. Uh, thank you, Nick, for the kind introduction. Uh, can you please confirm whether you all can hear me properly and you can see the screen? Yeah, but Hello? I mean, I can hear you at least. Okay. Too. Yep, someone else said they can too, so I think we're good. Okay, uh, so thank you. Uh, okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm Dr. Nisan uh, so, uh So I'm so excited today to conduct this virtual workshop on three-minute thesis uh, preparation, one of the graduate and uh, professional uh, development seminar series. The seminar comes under a 2023 seminar series. Um, yes. Okay, with that, uh, first of all, I thought uh, to tell you the uh, outline of our, or the flow of our discussion today. Uh, so first of all, uh, I thought uh, to give you uh, kind of like, share with you my experience uh, about this three minute thesis competition in Wayne State University. I will share uh, some information from my three empty story with Wayne State University. And then uh, I think that's kind of a motivation for you all. And then we will discuss some background information about this 3MT concept or the three minute thesis uh, competition. And with my experience, I would like to suggest you some important tips for a winning 3MT presentation. Okay, so that's the flow. And uh, at the same time, we are going to discuss some uh, specific information about the three minute thesis competition of Wayne State University Graduate School and Nick already mentioned some information and you have this information in graduate school website as well. Uh, however, since this is a preparation workshop or a preparation seminar for 3MT, I included that part as well. And then uh, I would give you some recommendations uh, for a winning 3MT competition from my experience. And then uh, we can have a QA and a session. So this is the flow of the presentation. And I would like to have an interactive session. So whenever you have a correction, you can uh, put that into the chat box and you know later on we can discuss those things. Right, uh, so as Nick mentioned, so I'm doing, I'm conducting this workshop from the other part of the world. Okay, so currently uh, I'm staying in Sri Lanka, my motherland, uh, which is a tiny island in the Indian Ocean. So this red dot is Sri Lanka uh, right below the India. Okay, some of you may have not heard about this country. It's a small island. And it's actually the time difference from US, it's like 10 hour difference. And it's about like 1.30 a.m. in the morning, a very early morning for me. And uh, currently I'm working in a medical school here. Uh, I'm a newly uh, recruited faculty member here uh, in Wyambo University of Sri Lanka. And it's a very cool experience for me uh, to conduct this virtual workshop uh, from Sri Lanka uh, to PhD students in uh, Wayne State University, Michigan, uh, because Wayne State is a place that I uh, spent more than eight years. So it's a very cool experience for me. And thanks to the advanced, you know, communication technologies, uh, despite the distance of the time, uh, we have the ability to conduct these kind of sessions. It's very, you know, it's the very, uh, it's a very cool thing, right? So first of all, I would like to tell you who am I and why I am here today to conduct this workshop. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, currently I'm staying in Sri Lanka. I'm a senior lecturer in biochemistry in a medical school, which is a newly established medical school in my hometown in Sri Lanka. 
which is why I'm the University of Sri Lanka. So that's my current position. And before I come to Sri Lanka in 2021, uh, two years ago, uh, I spent about eight years in USA. Uh, so basically I uh, completed my PhD in chemistry uh, in Department of Chemistry, Wayne State University. And my advisor was Dr. Christy Chow there. And uh, at the same time, during my PhD time, uh, I got the opportunity to serve as the graduate student assistant for the Wayne State NIH BEST program, where I work under uh, the advice of Dr. Ambika Mathur, the former dean of the Graduate School of Wayne State University. Right after I completed my PhD, uh, I joined as a postdoctoral research fellow uh, in Department of Biological Sciences of Wayne State University, and I worked three years there under the guidance of Dr. Gerard Schrader. So uh, now it's obvious that, you know, like, I have some history with Wayne State University, and uh, here that I just wanted to mention you, in addition to, now I'm a biochemist, in addition to my biochemical research experience, I gained a lot of things from Wayne State University, especially through this kind of professional development workshops and uh, through the, you know, the graduate and postdoctoral research symposium, I got uh, different opportunities and uh, this was very helpful for my, you know, when I was looking for jobs and when I was applying for the faculty positions. These, the things that I gained from Wayne State University, in addition to my biochemical research experience, they played a very big role. Therefore, uh, simply I would like to introduce myself as a proud alumni of Wayne State University. And uh, I think my talk will motivate you to participate in this professional development workshop, especially for 3MT. Uh, competition. Okay, so if I talk to you about why I am here today, uh, so as Nick mentioned at the beginning, uh, so I participated in this three-minute thesis competition before. It was actually uh, 2016, uh, the very first 3MT competition held in Wayne State University. In 2015, actually, we had a professional development workshop, uh, which was organized by the Graduate School of Wayne State University uh, for this 3MT competition. Uh, actually, now, during this time, now I was a third year PhD student, and my PhD advice to Dr. Christy Chow, uh, she always wanted us to, uh, rather than, you know, as biochemists, we have a lot of research to do, a lot of reading, writing articles, but she always encouraged us to go outside from the lab and explore other things in addition to the chemistry research. Okay, so as a result of that, uh, I went uh, to this 3MT competition, you know, I went to participate to this uh, professional development workshop with my lab mates. So that's the first time I heard about this word or this concept of 3MT, okay? So after participating into this workshop, actually it was conducted by a former associate dean and uh, professor in psychology, Dr. Anne Marie Cano. And it was a, you know, she did an amazing job explaining what is 3MT, what is this new concept of research communication. And uh, we watched several 3MT videos and she explained us basically what is 3MT. And, you know, after participating in the workshop, I was like, I really wanted to participate in this competition. Okay. So as a result of that, uh, in 2016, I participated into 3MT competition, the very first competition in Wayne State, and I won the first place. And actually in 2017, again, uh, we had the competition, but it's very formal competition compared to 2016 one. Uh, with the lessons we learned from the very first competition, we had a very organized competition in 2017. And actually my PhD advisor wants me to participate in that one as well. And there I won the People's Choice Award. So, uh, you know, like as an international student of Penn State University, as an international student in US, this was a very big achievement for me because when I first start to participate in the competition, I feel like my, I do not, my mother tongue is not English and I do not have the accent, you know, then I thought maybe I may not able to uh, participate, I may not able to win the competition. Um, however, with the guidance of, you know, uh, from the things that I learned from the professional development workshop and also uh, with the help of my PhD advisor, I could uh, win both competition and even today I consider this as one of the uh, milestone in my PhD. Um, so uh, in addition to these awards, now when I was working as a postdoctoral research fellow in Wayne State University, I, was, I got different opportunities to contribute 
to the three minute thesis competition of Wayne State University. For example, in 2019, I was invited uh, to serve as a judge of the 3MT competition. And in 2019, uh, as I am doing today, I conducted an in-person workshop on 3MT presentations uh, to PhD students and I, uh, in 2019, October. And then I came to Sri Lanka in last year. And again, the graduate school was kind enough to contact me and give me the opportunity to conduct uh, a virtual workshop on three minute thesis presentation. And again, I'm doing this year. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy, you know, uh, to contribute to the three minute thesis competition of Wayne State University in different ways. And uh, I consider it as a very uh, good experience for me as well as a scientist, as a young scientist. Uh, this was a very cool experience for me as well to improve my communication skills. Uh, so these are the things briefly uh, that brought me today to serve as the resource person for today's uh, discussion on this 3MT preparation of Wayne State University. So uh, uh, as I mentioned so far, you know, because of the 3MT competition, as a PhD student in, I, in my PhD career, I have a separate journey with 3MT theses and I have nice memories with 3MT. These are some clicks that uh, I got from graduate school uh, when I was participated in the 2017 uh, competition where I won the People Choice Award. And uh, here you can see I'm standing with other winners uh, of the 3MT competition that year. And this is Dr. Anne Marie Cano, the Associate Dean and the Professor uh, who conducted uh, the professional development workshop for us. And she helped me a lot and motivated me to participate in the competition. And uh, these are very uh, you know, nice experience and nice memories uh, from my PhD journey in three minutes uh, in Wayne State University with this 3MT competition. Uh, and in addition to that, I want to share another important information with you. So after I participated uh, in this 3MT competition and after I uh, won this People's Choice Award, uh, I was given a micro-credential badge uh, from Wayne State Graduate School, which is kind of like uh, an electronic certification uh, for my oral presentation skill. Okay, so I can share this micro-credential badge in my LinkedIn profile, in my CV, and it was actually very helpful for me at the beginning when I was looking for jobs. Uh, you know, it is kind of like a certification that I can show to my prospect prospective employers that I have some skills in addition to biochemical research. You know, when it come, when when we are looking for jobs, it's not on there. The employers are not only looking for uh, your research skills, right? They also like to see your soft skills, your presentation skills, your teamwork and ability, things like that, and. Uh, because of this 3MT thesis competition, I received this uh, electronic badge uh, for my oral presentation skills. So these are some good achievements, you know, uh, I got, I received uh, after participating to this competition. And I think uh, for, even for you all, this is going to be a very nice experience. And uh, this is, I shared, this information about my 3MT experience with you all, because it's, I think it's kind of a motivation for you to uh, participate the incoming 3MT competition, not only the 3MT competition, but also to participate in some other professional development workshops organized by the graduate school. Uh, because uh, I would like to introduce myself as an example, uh, because uh, after participating to these different professional development workshops, you know, uh, it was very uh, helpful for my career as a scientist. Uh, with that um, experience, uh, previous experience, you know, now I would like to uh, change the topic and uh, give you some brief background information about the three minute thesis concept. Okay, so three minute uh, is a, it's a, a very popular communication uh, technique or a communication method. And initially, uh, this was developed by the University of Queensland in 2008. However, uh, you know, now it, this is 2023, almost 15 years. So, you know, we cannot tell it is as a new research communication method. Now it is already spread all around the world. And now it is very popular. It's very popular method of research communication. Um, and uh, actually now, 
uh, when I checked uh, information about 3MT in the internet, I found out that throughout the world, more than 200 universities have 3MT competitions as annual competitions in their universities. Even after I came to Sri Lanka, uh, I got to know in several Sri Lankan universities also, they organize this 3MT competition, which is a very cool thing about 3MT. And uh, if we discuss the basic things about this 3MT concept, as the name implies, uh, in these 3MT presentations, you're going to present your thesis work using a very uh, short presentations. The time is just three minutes, okay? So that's the challenging part. And you cannot use several slides. It has to be one single static slide, okay? So that's the challenging part. You have to condense or distill your research into three minutes, okay? Uh, and the other thing is that now, Usually when you give your, when you give research talk, right? When you're discussing about your research, uh, you have like a uh, scientific audience, right? If you give a talk in your, talk to your research group, you have your peers and you have your advisor, PhD advisor and postdoctoral advisors like that. Uh, so usually you give scientific talk to a scientific audience and they are very familiar with what you're talking about. You do not have to think about specific words or simple words to convey your message to this audience, right? But uh, contrast to that, when it comes to three minute thesis competition, you have to present your work or present your research to a general audience, or we can say it's a non-specialist audience. Therefore, you have to present, uh, you have to give your talk in an interesting way and we can say it has to be a compelling presentation. So those are the, the ones that I highlighted in these slides are the important facts about 3MT, the things that you have to pay your attention. It has to be three minutes and it's just single slide and it has to be an interesting presentation or a compelling presentation that is given to a non-specialist audience. So these are the important facts uh, about 3MT presentation or this 3MT concept. So we will discuss detail about these things in later on. Um, so with my experience, uh, as a, you know, when I was a PhD student, I participated in the competition and then I serve as a judge and also as a resource person for these workshops. And from my experience, uh, I would say I can basically give you like three tips for, for 3MT, okay? Before you, uh, before you stand for a 3MT presentation, I would say you have to ask three questions from you. The first one is, how does your research relate to the real world? Okay, how your research going to impact? What is the impact of your research? Okay, how your research is going to change the world? In order to deliver this message, you have to completely understand what you are doing and how you're going, to, what is the impact of your research to the real world? So that's the, uh, simply I can say, you have to think about the big picture of your research. Okay, so that's the very first thing. And the next thing is how we are going to deliver this message to the audience, okay? Because it's just three minutes. Starting from the first second, you have to grab the attention of your audience and keep that for that three minutes, right? Therefore, uh, you have to think about different ways. How you grab the attention of your audience? What are the different uh, things you can do to grab the attention from the beginning of your talk to the end? Okay, so that's the second thing. And the last and the most important thing is how much you practice for your 3MT. So as I mentioned several times, the challenging part of this communication method or this 3MT is the time, right? It's just three minutes. Within three minutes, you have to uh, convey your message or to give the take home message of your research to a non-specialist audience. Therefore, uh, without practicing, you cannot do that. Simply I can say, practice make it perfect. So you have to practice many times. You have to pay attention to the time and to your PowerPoint slide and the way you talk. Without that practice, you may not able to do it confidently. So these are the three important facts. So we will discuss a little detail about each of these topics later on uh, that you should aware of when you're uh, doing a three minute thesis presentation. Okay, so if we discuss more about these things now, as I mentioned before, the first question is how your research changed the world. In order to do that, 
uh, you have to think about the big picture of your research, okay? Now, if it is, you know, if let's say if it is a biochemistry research, you have so many experiments, you have uh, read different papers, you know, it's a lot of work and it's very complex, right? But inside, in this complex research, you have to find out the interesting facts and how you are going to apply the knowledge that you gain from your research, uh, I mean, to change the world or uh, how it is applied to the real world. What is the application of your work? Okay, so that's, the, that's very important. When the audience leave the seminar hall, they should have uh, in their mind, the take home message from your presentations. Okay, so she's doing this research uh, to overcome this disease. So she's finding drugs for this disease. So, so something like that. Okay, so simply uh, you have to give the take home message to your audience in an interesting way. Uh, for example, now if I take my example, my thesis, the title of my thesis is investigation of the in vivo activity of ribosome targeting peptides and aminoglycosides in Escherichia coli or E. coli. So here, I mean, I don't know whether it's easy for most of you to understand what I am, what I did for my thesis, right? In vivo, what is, what's the meaning of in vivo and what is ribosome? Because I'm talking to a non-specialist audience, right? I'm not talking to biochemist. So they may not know what is ribosome and what are peptides and what are aminoglycosides, okay? So it's very scientific, right? It has a lot of science, scientific words and scientific jargon. So it's, if I use this title for my 3MT, it won't work. Therefore, I had to think about uh, to give the general idea or the I, they, I have to think about the big picture of the research, right? In my case, basically, if I simply tell you what I did, to kill bacteria, okay, to overcome the antibiotic resistance. So antibiotic resistance is the uh, issue that I was trying to address in my thesis. Uh, so I use the title, Combat Antibiotic Resistance, No Action Today, No Cure Tomorrow. So that's the title, okay? So like that, you have to distill your research into a simple uh, title, into a simple talk and present it in an interesting way. I hope uh, you all follow me. Yes. And the next one is, uh, how do you grab the attention of your audience? Okay. Now here, actually, this is very important, especially now your talk should have a flow, right? It should have, an, uh, it should have a nice beginning. And then you present your findings or the content of your talk. And then what is the conclusion or what is the finding and how it's going to change the world? So here I would say you have to, when you when we discuss about the talk of your 3MT, it has to be, it has, it should have an attractive opening statement. Okay, so this is my research, and this is what I'm trying to solve using my research findings. And you have to make the curiosity in the audience to find more information about your research. Therefore, it has to be a very strong opening statement, or the first few sentences has to be very attractive that can grab the attention of the audience from the, uh, during the first second, okay? And in addition to that, when you are presenting, you have to show like, maybe you're not happy about what you're doing, right? But you have to show how interesting your research is and you have to show basically your enthusiasm on the research. In order to gain other people's attention, you have to show, okay, I'm happy about what I'm doing and this is how I'm going to change the world using my findings. So it has, you have to show that enthusiasm from your face, okay? And in addition to the talk and your enthusiasm, in order to show all of these things, you have to think about your body language, your eye contact, your facial expressions, and also most importantly, voice control play a big role when it comes to uh, when we discuss about attention, but grabbing attention of the audience, okay? I would simply say, you have to uh, basically acting like a storyteller, okay? So when I am telling about a storyteller, right? We all have this experience, like right? Listening to a story from a storyteller or a, from your grandma, your parents, your mom and dad, like that. You know, like kids love uh, to listen to stories, right? because the way they deliver the message or the moral message of the story is 
they are delivering it in an interesting way, right? So if you think about, you know, a storyteller, they have these facial expressions and eye contact and they control their voice. So like that, basically, you are converting your complex research into an interesting story and deliver it to a general audience. So it's a very important fact. Uh, since I mentioned about the voice control here, another key point is you have to keep in mind that uh, you have to pause at the key points, okay? Basically, you have to give time to the audience to think about what you are saying, right? Uh, now you may think, now we have only three minutes, okay? We have to start from, it should have a nice beginning, and then we have to think about body language, eye contact, facial expressions, and also, now I'm asking you to give time to audience to think about what you are saying, right? Is it possible? Actually, it's a challenge, okay? Within these three minutes, you have to pay attention to all of these things. At the same time, I am asking you to grab the attention of the audience as well, right? So that's why I'm telling you the third one, okay? How much you practice your presentation, okay? I know it's challenging. It's not an easy job, but practice make it perfect. Without practicing, you may not be able to do this thing, okay? Maybe you can do other research talk. You can think and looking at the slide and discuss what you are telling. But here, it's totally different, right? You have to be well prepared to give a nice uh, oral presentation or to give a nice 3 mt oral presentation. So here, actually, I would like to give you one recommendation from my experience. Even I tried this, actually. Now, before the presentation, record or videotape your presentation. And later on, you can watch it and you can listen to your voice. And uh, then actually you can identify the weak points, okay? For example, you can identify the places where you talk too quickly or the, uh, you can adjust the face of your talk. And at the same time, you can find out the places that you have to force your talk like that. Uh, it's a very good practice uh, to do the recordings of your talk and listen to that. Even you can do the videotaping, right? Then you can look at your body language and if you want, you can adjust that one as well. And it is something that I practice and work for me. And the other thing is that, uh, as I mentioned many times, so this is the challenging part, the time, right? It's just three minutes. So during this practice, when you practice these things, you have to pay attention to the time as well. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that it has to be exactly three minutes, but if it is two minutes, no, it's too short. And if it is, four minutes or 3.5 minutes. No, it's also too long. So it has to be, you know, around that three minutes. So that's challenging and uh, the practice make it perfect again. So you have to pay attention uh, when you do the uh, talk, okay? You have to uh, pay attention to the time. The other thing is that now it's true. I mean, you know, like if you feel nervous before the presentation, okay? It's very natural, right? As human beings, you know, when we give a talk in front of uh, people, even today, right? I feel nervous because uh, I'm responsible for the talk and you are listening to me. So I feel like before the talk, I feel a little nervous. It's very normal. But the important thing is the practice, right? With practice, even though you feel a little nervous uh, to talk in front of the audience now, I think in virtual, last time we had 3MT in virtual platform. So this time you're going to have it in a real stage in front. I'm not sure whether it's, I think it's virtual audience though. Anyway, you feel nervous, it's very natural, but with practice, uh, you have the confident and you can do it very confidently and clarity with practice. Therefore, practice uh, many times and then you can easily make it perfect, okay? So these are the three main things that I identified. There are so many other tips, you know, you have to think about what you're wearing for the talk and how you like, you know, like there are a lot of other things, okay? Your gestures and all these things, but under these three uh, main tips, you know, uh, these are the main uh, three things that you have to think about when you're preparing for your 3MT presentation. All right, so I think, uh, that's some background information and tips that I want to share with you. Uh, I think it's good to change the topic and watch some 3MT videos. And then, you know, we can uh, do some discussions about these uh, videos. Uh, I have, I selected several videos from Wayne State as well as some other universities. So we can watch them and uh, we can discuss what are the good and bad points of each of these presentations. And we can learn from them as well. Uh, okay, so let me share the first video with you all. 
When I walk up, okay. Can someone confirm whether you can hear the video and whether you can see the video? Hello. Yes, I can. Okay, I hope it's working. Yeah, let me start it. Okay. When I woke up in the morning, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic, but I guess that was exactly what I did. Okay, so this is what Sir Alexander Fleming famously wrote after his accidental discovery of penicillin, the first antibiotic in 1928. Today, none of us can imagine living in a world without antibiotics. But the problem is, for the last few decades, people have been overusing these drugs. As a result of that, bacteria become less sensitive to antibiotics, causing the problem of antibiotic resistance, a public health crisis. In 2015, it was reported that bacterial infections cause more than 23,000 deaths and over 1 million diseases in the United States every year. So it is obvious that bacterial infections are spreading faster than the introduction of new drugs to kill bacteria. So it is urgent and necessary to develop new drugs with antibacterial activity. So this is where my research comes into play. The ultimate goal of my research is to identify small molecules with antibacterial activity. The drugs we are studying are not very complex molecules. They are small drugs called peptides. So the first question is, what are these peptides? So peptides are components of proteins which are natural, non-toxic, and most importantly, can be easily manipulated as drugs. So the next question is, how can we control bacteria using our drugs? So our rationale is as follows. If our drug can bind to an important part of the bacteria cell, it can block the function and reduce the growth of bacteria. So our strategy is something similar to what I show in this slide. So it's like disrupting the production line of a busy factory by adding something to disrupt the production machinery. So that's why we selected the bacterial ribosome, the protein production machinery of bacteria cell, as our drug target. So in our lab, we identify small drugs specifically bind to bacterial ribosome using special selection techniques. And one interesting finding is that the drugs we found specifically bind the bacterial ribosome over human ribosomes, which means our drugs do not cause any harm or they do not toxic to human cells. So currently, we are doing further modifications to enhance the antibacterial activity of our drugs, which we hope will lead to an effective drug one day. The theme of the World Health Day in 2011 was combat antibiotic resistance. No action today, no cure tomorrow. So I'm really happy to be a part of a research team combating the problem of antibiotic resistance. Thank you. Uh, so uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, so actually that was the presentation I gave in 2017. Um, so we can discuss, you know, good and bad things. I'm, I'm not telling that this is the best one. Even I can see now when I look at that, I can see, oh my God, I use some lot of scientific learning things like that. So let's discuss. So what do you think? What are the good things and what are the things that have to be improved in this presentation? Any idea? I mean, yeah, anything that you notice? Come yes, off exactly. Of and, uh, and chat. Yes. Please go ahead and tell your ideas. And I mean, we can just discuss, okay? Uh, yes. Someone raise his hand. Yeah. Hello. Hello. It seems to be somebody on a phone. It doesn't have a name, but whoever is on the oh. Galaxy tab can uh, tab A7. Yep. respond. Hello? Yes, Hi. please go ahead. Hi. Okay. 
So uh, I wanted to say that that was a very, very interesting, uh, engaging uh, presentation. I'm sorry, it's not very clear. Yeah, you're going in and out. Um, while he is figuring out his uh, his device there, I did see a question in the chat about oh, okay. the slide that people presented. Uh, and the answer is no, you do not need to present the slide that you presented. You mm -hmm. are welcome to make any changes that you want um, based on your submission. I, I we, ex we expect most of you to make some changes especially following um, this presentation because you're getting some best practices here and um, you wanna be able to make your adjustments. You really just need to bring your slide on the day of. Um, you, you can make edits all the way up till, you know, till the symposium. Uh, yes, Nick, I think you answered the question regarding the one slide, right? Do we need to present only one slide? So there's a question in the chat box. Uh, saying that do we need to present only one slide that we submitted already? Uh, so yeah, because maybe... they had to submit a slide as part of their uh -huh. application. Okay. Part. So yeah, they, it doesn't have to be the same one. Um, and we also, for those of you who are selected as finalists, we will be in contact with mm -hmm. you between now and the symposium with a couple of recommendations just to make sure that you have a good, um, you're putting your putting your best foot forward. Right. And uh, I think someone commented on the presentation, the one that I showed, uh, says that the introductory statement was very catchy and interesting and picked the attention of the audience immediately. Uh, so in my presentation, if I talk honestly with you, I, I mean, I like the way that I started the presentation, okay? Because in my presentation, I was talking about the antibiotic resistance and I decided to start my talk uh, mentioning about the discovery of penicillin, right? The very first antibiotic. And uh, I think it worked for me, okay? And uh, that's one good thing about my presentation. And also, uh, when I looked at my presentation as a, you know, uh, as a judge, now I feel like the way that I uh, use my hands and, you know, the gestures also worked. Those are also good. And I want to mention one thing. This is not the real presentation I did because this is something that the Wayne's, after I won the competition, Wayne State Graduate School, they invited me to do a, you know, a promotional video for students. And this was actually, I hear I talk in front of the camera, but in the real competition, I will share some photos with you. Uh, I, did on, I did my presentation on the stage and I had the freedom to walk because you, I'm a person who walked when I was giving talk, you know? I feel like uh, I like to do it like that way. And uh, here I feel like I talk a little fast too because I'm talking to the camera and I feel a little uncomfortable when I did this one. Uh, for me, the, the day that I did the real presentation is way better than this one. Uh, yeah, that's one comment. And one thing that from my presentation, what I realized, I feel like I use a little bit you know, scientific jargon. Sometimes, you know, it's really hard to get rid of scientific words. For example, in my presentation, I had to use the word peptide. There is no any other options to use instead of that word, you know, so like that, there are some scientific jargon too. Any other comments or suggestions, you know, any other comments about the presentation of my presentation, good and bad things that you noticed? There was one thing in the chat about a strong yes. introductory statement. Yes, I, I, yeah, that's the strong introductory, strong introductory statement. I agree with that. And another one, I really love the machinery production. Yes. So here, actually, now I have a separate slide discuss about how I came up with this idea and the slide. So here, now I wanted to tell, I designed some drugs that block the function of the ribosome. Okay. And I consider ribosome as a factory. Here, I use an analogy, the factory analogy to tell the audience what I'm doing. Okay, so that also worked for me in the PowerPoint slide, the factory analogy. I'll show you separately how I came up with that idea. Yes, it's also a good point that I consider uh, as a plus point in my presentation. And uh, when you do the real presentation, your face has to be, you know, it, you have to be a little slower than I presented in this video. Uh, so yeah, so we can go to, I think Nick, we have some time for several other videos as well, right? Yeah, you can go ahead and play another one for sure. Yes, sure. 14,500. Okay, can you see that video?
Hello. Yes. Can you? Yes. Okay, I will you say can... that one. Yes. The anchors post about their personal and professional activity. Okay, sorry, I'll start from the beginning, okay? These three women are news anchors in Metro Detroit. Amy Andrews, Rhonda Walker, and Alicia Smith work for channels 2, 4, and 7. Like many news anchors, they work for organizations that expect them to engage with audiences on Facebook, the social media platform that had 2.3 billion monthly active users in the fourth quarter of 2018. Amy Andrews has about 56,000 followers. Rhonda Walker has about 15,000, and Alicia Smith has about 14,500. The anchors post about their personal and professional activity, and their Facebook followers seem to feel a sense of closeness to them. For example, one of Amy Andrews' followers posted on her page that he had just become a great-grandfather, and he just wanted to let her know. When Rhonda Walker got engaged last year, that post had about 2,000 likes, 700 comments, and 80 shares. As for Alicia Smith, she's been asked when she and her husband will be having children. So my study asks this, how do journalists' audience relationships online affect the perception of journalists, news products, and the profession overall? My study aims to understand how Facebook is abundant ground for something called parasocial interaction. Now, parasocial interaction theory is a theory about an intimate, one-way connection that feels real to an audience member, even while absent of real-life interpersonal communication. While parasocial interaction originally started as a theory that examined television, my study expands communication scholarship by studying the social media platform that has been the most widely used in the last decade. Through analyzing what the journalists post, as well as conducting surveys with their followers, my study aims to measure four things. The influence of journalists in online interactions with audiences, audience perception of journalists, audience perception of news products, and audience perception of the journalism profession overall. So why should you care? Before social media, parasocial interaction was in the mind of the beholder, but social media has given journalists expansive, sophisticated power in that interaction, changing what used to be organic influence into calculated influence at their fingertips. Okay, so what do you think about her, Ellen uh, Erin's talk? Actually, she's the uh, winner, the second place winner and the People's Choice Awardee uh, of uh, 2019 competition. Uh, so what do you think? Any uh, special things that you notice in her presentation? Yes. Yes. Hello. Presentation. Uh, someone is trying to talk, uh, but I don't know. Maybe it's a poor connection. Anyway, uh, so one thing that I want to mention in Ellen's talk is that Erin's talk. Uh, now, you know, like in my research, in my 3MG, it's very, you know, it's a scientific. I use many technical terms. And I try my best to get rid of a lot of scientific jargon, but it's kind of hard, you know, when it comes to the scientific talks, but we have to try our best to make it simple and interesting. But in her case, you know, she was talking about, it's not very technical, right? Something uh, that associated with our day-to-day -day life, you know, uh, the social media and everyone use these things. So I think in her case, it's kind of easy uh, to give the message, right? compared to those technical ones. And I also, and there is also one comment then saying that her face is good, yes. I also want to mention that one, the way, uh, it's not very fast, the way uh, she, uh, I mean, her face is very good, okay? Uh, yeah, so that's all. And yes, someone was saying she's very, more, in, uh, I think the introduction could have been more engaging, but the face of her talk was very good, yes. I agree with that comment. And also, again, it's not a very technical uh, research. So it's the, the speaker has some, you know, 
flexibility in that case. You know, it's easy uh, to co convey to a general audience as well, since we all use these social media platforms, we know, right? It's easy to give the message rather than com compared to a scientific uh, research. Okay, so shall I go ahead and play another video? Uh, yeah, I think you can play one more. Okay, so I would pick this one then. So today, I'm here to teach you how to grow an ear using fat. Now, you're probably thinking I'm either crazy or wasting my time, because this has already been done before. You've all seen the photo of the mouse with the ear on its back? Well, sadly, it hasn't. Whilst this made for a great photo, it's not delivered us anything we've been able to translate to human use. So why is it important? Well, one in every 4,000 children are born missing either one or both of their ears. And the surgical procedure that we perform to reconstruct this requires us to remove ribs from the patient, and the cartilage from those ribs is used to carve a new ear. This is a major operation with significant risks and significant complications. And therefore, I believe there must be a better solution. And the ability to grow an ear would be a major step forwards. So back to our mouse. It didn't fix the problem, but it showed us two key principles that if you want to engineer any tissue, you need one of two things. Firstly, the right type of cells. And secondly, the right scaffold on which they will grow. And this is the basis of my project, to identify cells and scaffolds that I can use to grow cartilage for ear reconstruction. So the human body is an organism whose lifespan is measured in decades. But the individual cells which comprise it have a lifespan which is measured in only days. It's therefore intuitive that the body must contain populations of cells that are capable of replenishing and renewing itself. And these are our stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells, the stem cells that can regenerate cartilage, live in direct relationship to the smallest of blood vessels found throughout the human body. This means that we can purify these stem cells from a readily accessible, and in my case, readily abundant source. <laughs> Adipose tissue is a fantastic source of stem cells. So I found the cells, now I need to find the scaffold. Polymers. Polymers are long chains of molecules which have shown the ability to support cell growth. Using a special printer, I've screened a library of over 2,000 individual polymers. And from that, I've identified five specific polymers which allow my stem cells to attach, proliferate, and then subsequently differentiate into cartilage-like cells. The final 12 months of my project is going to be dedicated to turning these polymers into three-dimensional scaffolds that I can use to grow pieces of cartilage for ear reconstruction. Am I excited about my project? Yeah, I really am. <laughs> Are you excited about what you've heard? I really hope so, and thank you for listening. Okay, so what do you think about Chris' presentation? Uh, his title is Blood, Sweat and Years. So what do you think, his presentation? Any ideas? Really strong intro and outro. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and one thing, you know, I picked this presentation because I like the way, you know, he had some humor to his presentation as well, right? So when he was talking about the adipose tissue, he was like uh, showing himself, right? And I like how he had humor and how he was trying to grab attention of the audience with that. Adding too much humor is also not good, right? It has to be very professional, but, you know, sometimes you can add, you know, you can make it a little interesting, uh, as well. And another point that I want to highlight in his research as well, again, uh, I think he used some, you know, scientific, a lot of like scientific words like polymer, scaffold, adipose tissues, and many more like that. I mean, it would be a great, I mean, uh, presentation if we can get rid of those scientific jargon. I think it's hard, but 
he can try. And also in the presentation, in the PowerPoint slide, the one that I'm showing you now, I like that he show what is the problem. And basically he's trying to do his research with this mice model. And then when it comes to the progress, actually just by looking at the pictures, it's hard to follow it. But I would say like, I can see some kind of a flow in his presentation as well. Uh, yep. So any other ideas or comments from you all? I guess not. Okay, and actually now Nick, you have answered some of the questions, right? They were asking about different software that we can yeah. use to create figures, things like that. I think we are good at that. And in my presentation, someone mentioned that we do not discuss about like a lot of uh, research findings. Actually, I was trying to give the overall picture. And in my research, we were identified some drugs, those only binds to bacteria and not to human. And I mentioned that one as a finding. But other than that, you know, in, when it comes to my research project, I had a lot of binding data and a lot of, you know, numbers, and I didn't want to show all of those things. I just wanted to simply say the drugs that we found do not bind to, you know, human. It does not toxic to human. I simply say like that, I think. So like that, you can uh, distill your finding and give it to a general audience, okay? Uh, with that, let me move back to the presentation. Can you see slides, the PowerPoint yeah. slides? Okay, uh, I think it's enough, right? Uh, we uh, watch several videos, and I think there are a lot, there are so many other videos in the uh, you know like YouTube. You can watch them and you can learn you know uh, different uh, points from by watching these videos as well. And since the focus of the talk today or the seminar is to prepare you for the three MT of Wayne State University, I included. Uh, some information regarding the real competition as well. What is the eligibility for participating to the competition and uh, what are the awards? And, you know, the winner can participate in the uh, regional competition as well, which is organized by Midwestern Association of Graduate School. And I'm not going to read each and every information because all of this information uh, is posted in the Wayne State uh, Graduate School website. Okay, and one more thing that I wanted to highlight here now, under the rules, you can find a lot of information about your PowerPoint slide. So someone was asking whether, like, how many slides we can use. It's just one static slide, and you cannot use any, you know, it has to be very clear. And if you want, you can include text, but it's not something necessary, okay? And you cannot include any slide transitions, animations, or sounds. It's prohibited. You cannot use, those are not permitted. Uh, for this static PowerPoint slide. Actually, it plays a big role when it comes to the presentation, okay? Uh, it plays a silent role there, your PowerPoint slide. But I want to highlight here, you are the presentation, not the slide. So why I'm telling that, when you give the presentation, the PowerPoint slide is displayed on the stage, right? On a screen. So it just helps you to enhance your presentation, but don't try to read it or just look at the slide without, you have to look at the audience, right? But uh, the slide for sure help you to grab the attention of the audience. It has a lot of info, important information there, but uh, you know, you have to keep that in mind. You are the presentation and only uh, this is just facilitate the presentation, okay? Now, I just wanted to see some, there were some questions about this slide. So let me tell you how I came up with my PowerPoint presentation, okay? And here I included these figures. I just wanted to show you, this is the real competition. You know, when I do the presentation, not like talking to the camera, you know, I had the freedom to talk and, you know, how many gestures and describe. everything. Hey, the yeah. screen is blank right now. I don't think we can see anything. Oh, okay. Uh, can you see it now, Nick? Yep. Okay. Yeah, what I wanted to tell that when you do the real presentation, you have the freedom to, you know, uh, use your body language. You know, you can walk and you can use the gestures and like that. And the PowerPoint presentation is there. It just facilitate your presentation. Don't look at the PowerPoint presentation and read what is there. It's just uh, some additional information for your audience, okay? 
And this is how I came up with the winning version of my PowerPoint slide. I'm not telling it is the best one, but I will tell you, I'm going to tell you how I came up with that version. So this is the very first slide I had when I prepare for the 3MT competition, okay? This is the version one. So I, I had the title from the beginning, and then I included some tablets. Someone is holding some tablets and put them into the bacterial ribosome. This is the ribosome structure in the bacterial cell. And then I showed this to my advisor, Dr. Chow, and she was like, what is this? What are you trying to say? So it doesn't make sense. What do you mean by 50 years, 30 years? Do you think they can understand what do you mean by 50 years, 30 years? And then she said, go ahead and come up with another version. I don't like this. And it, this is not for 3MT. And then, you know, I thought like, okay, in my research, I'm trying to kill bacteria by designing a drug that can bind to ribosome. Okay, it stopped the protein synthesis. Okay, it's some scientific stuff. And then I have bacteria and uh, the drug goes and binds to the bacterial ribosome and it reduces the growth. I showed this version two to my advice and she said, okay, this is way better than what you showed me before, but still you have some, you know, come up with something interesting. Think ribosome is a machinery. Then what happened in a factory, in a busy factory, if you block the machine, what happened to the production line? Then I got, okay, so this is what she meant by this. And I came with my winning version. I don't know whether you can comment on this, okay? But uh, this is what I came up with. This is the final slide. Then I compare the bacterial ribosome to a busy factory, okay? We have the raw materials here and we can see the products are coming out, right? A nicely working machine. But what happened if I put something and block the machinery, we cannot see the products, right? So the similar thing happened in bacteria. We have bacteria and we block the machine and then we can see there is no production or we cannot, we can see it's killing bacteria. So this, this is the factory, factory analogy I used uh, for my PowerPoint presentation. And also actually this is very good discussion that I had with my PhD advisor because then I included this into my talk as well. Think ribosome as a factory. And what happened to the machinery when you add something to block it? So like that, I can create the flow of my talk uh, with this slide. And it helped me a lot uh, to deliver the message to the general audience, okay? Uh, with that, I mean, if I tell some rules about the 3MT of Wayne State University, so it has to be three minutes and all of the things that we discussed so far uh, summarized in these last few slides. I think I do not have to go and read each and every statement here. You, I'm going to share these slides with you and you, you, know, the, uh, you will get the presentation, the recorded version. And uh, you can find all of this information in graduate school website. So um, I'm not going to uh, read last few slides. Uh, okay, so already uh, it's, it's repeating the things that we discussed. And uh, yes, and as Nick mentioned, uh, so you're going to face to the three minute thesis competition in the incoming graduate research symposium. I'm not exactly sure, Nick, when will be the three MT competition? Is it the last day of the symposium? It's, yep, it's on the last day, um, starting at 10 a.m. Okay, and for more information, please uh, go and check uh, this guidelines in the graduate school website. And uh, uh, from the things that we discussed so far and after watching these videos, I have some recommendations for you uh, to do a winning 3MT presentation. So the first thing that I want to tell, practice many times and practice make it perfect, okay? Before my presentations, I did a lot of practice and then I didn't have to worry about the time challenge or anything. So it was, it helped me a lot. And as I mentioned before, record yourself do videotaping of your presentation and then you can identify the weak points and improve your talk. And also you have to dress professionally, but it has to be comfortable. Okay, so since it's a research talk, it has to be very professional, but uh, it has to be very comfortable as well. Then you can, you know, it's easy for you to conduct uh, the presentation uh, with that. And also, as I mentioned before, try to grab the attention of the audience, think about your body language, the face of your talk, and you have to pose the places that you want, that you have to, right? And give some time to them to understand, to digest the message to the audience. And the audience should leave the hall 
having a take home message from your research. Okay, so you have to think about interesting facts about your research and how you give the big picture of research to the audience. Okay, so these are some recommendations from my side uh, for a winning 3MT presentation. And uh, there are some resources, uh, the 3MT website and also uh, some previous videos and uh, graduate school website. And also, if you have any questions, please email me. Okay, I'm very happy to help you all. Uh, I can check your PowerPoint presentations if you want, and you can email me. And I have my two email addresses here, so you can uh, write to me. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, I want to thank uh, Graduate School of Penn State University for inviting me to conduct this workshop for the second time. This is the second virtual workshop that I conduct in from Sri Lanka. And thank you so much, Nick, for arranging everything and coordinate this event. And uh, also, you know, I want to mention about Dr. Todd Leff, the Associate Dean. Uh, he also, uh, he was very helpful uh, with this. And also I want to mention here, my mentors at Wayne State University, Dr. Christy Chow, my PhD advisor, uh, and also a former Dean, Dr. Amita Mathur, uh, my advisor for the Wayne State BEST program. Uh, and also uh, I would say she's one of the best advisors that I met through the BEST program. And also Dr. Gerard Schrader, my postdoctoral advisor, uh, unless they let me go outside the laboratory uh, and explore these things. I may not able to do this workshop today and I really want to acknowledge them uh, for giving me this opportunity. And thank you everyone for your participation. And if you have any questions, I'm here, uh, we can discuss. Thank you so much, Nick. Yep. Thank you so much, Nisantla. Again, we'll share some of those resources in the thank you email that comes out tomorrow. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. And yeah, we'll be sending out the finalist list in the next day or so. So thanks, everybody. And uh, have a good rest of the day.